be prepared to fail. And by that, I mean, you sit in the class and there will be things you don't understand. That's okay. Go out and look them up or sometimes it's okay just not to know something while you're getting into the field. And when you take that first certification test, not everybody passes the first time. That does not mean you're not going to thrive and flourish in this field. I'll tell you the truth. The very first certification test I ever took was um, back with the Microsoft Systems, um, uh, Systems Engineer Certification. And I needed a 700 to pass. And I had this big 1,100-page book, and I took 80 pages of handwritten notes. I have never studied so hard in my entire life as I had for that class. Needed 700 to pass. I get a 683. I was not really used to trying really hard and not being successful. I was kind of the person in high school that could kick back and just uh, absorb information, do pretty well on tests, but I worked hard and I failed this. So I go out into the parking lot back in the days of pay phones. I swear to God, I called my mama. I'm not smart enough to do this. All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Cyberry Podcast, your number one source for cybersecurity news and thoughtful discussions. I am here with the one, the only, the famous and the infamous Kelly Handerhan. I am Sarah Faraji. I'm the new course manager here at Cyberry, and I have been working with Kelly on this amazing new course C-I-S-S-P. And it has been an incredible experience. We've been here in the studio. Kelly has been uh, recording all of these wonderful lessons. I'm in the back. And the reason why I said Kelly is famous, but also infamous, as I'm listening, you know, with the headphones on, I'm hearing you talk about things like governance, risk, and compliance, and security policies. And then as you're talking about that, I'm hearing all of these colorful stories about how you had your license temporarily suspended in North Carolina. I did say perhaps (laughs) was suspended. I admitted nothing. All right. And I'm going to stick with that. Full disclosure. Okay. And then I'm hearing how you and a team of nurses were bypassing an internal uh, proxy server to go on eBay. You got a shop. (laughs) You got a shot. Yeah. So it's just amazing hearing you telling these great stories. And I just want to learn from you right off the bat. How did you become such a great storyteller? Oh, <laughs> because I love to talk. <laughs> and, um, you know, certain things just strike me as funny. And I always like to find a way to share, you know, these experiences. And uh, if it's something that makes me laugh, hopefully it's something that'll make somebody else laugh. And I just enjoy retelling these little events that have gone on throughout my career. Wow. Uh, you know, it's just great to hear, uh, again, all of these stories. I mean, I know that in the past you were an English major, as I was as well. So uh, how did you make this transition from kind of English storytelling? Uh, maybe that's why you're such a good storyteller with the English major background. How did you get into cybersecurity? Oh, that's that's a great question. And it wasn't really a path I had planned out. Um, Yeah, like you'd said, I went into college originally to major in English, but as I was surveying the um, economic landscape, people weren't spending a lot of money to pay somebody to come out to their company and recite poetry. So I felt like perhaps I could uh, maybe find something a little bit more lucrative that I'd still enjoy. So I do. I enjoy uh, writing. I enjoy, you know, speaking and telling tales, which probably does come from having a background as an English major. But I wanted to move into something that was a little bit more current, a little bit more meaningful with the climate of the times. And, you know, to be quite honest, something that paid a little better. Hey, I think you made a great decision. I hear all that you're saying. And you know, you're talking about kind of transitioning into cybersecurity. And I feel like a lot of our learners uh, here at Cybrary and in, on different platforms are 
really also in this process of kind of getting into the field, making a transition from something else. And also there's this thing that we talk about a lot called the cybersecurity skills gap. I was interested to hear your perspective on that. And how do you see yourself as trying to help rectify this issue? Um, yeah. So with the cybersecurity skills gap is that we have a lot of need in today's uh, environment for people that are knowledgeable with cybersecurity, people that um, we need good threat intelligence, we need good response capabilities, we need good detection capabilities, and quite honestly, we don't have enough people to fill these jobs, right? So there are a couple of ways that we can address that. We can take people that are already in IT and train them with the new skills, and obviously that's very important to do. Um, one of the great things about IT is you can evolve in your role within the organization. There's always something new. There's always something that you can specialize in. You can always broaden your horizons. Now, the other solution to this problem is to take people that maybe are in other careers that they just don't find satisfying anymore. And that was certainly my experience. That's how I came into IT. Uh, I was not somebody that took apart candy computers when I was three years old. I, um, you know, just was was a career changer, as I like to call it. And I, I like to think that I really have a specialty working with career changers and helping folks that maybe have found one career that they've spent a lot of time with, but have just decided, hey, this isn't for me anymore. I want to try something new and I want to get into cybersecurity. So we've got two things that we want to do. We want to enhance the skills of existing IT professionals, and we also want to make an, a cybersecurity career um, practical and attainable for folks from other careers. And I like to think that I play a part in that through the courses that I teach and possibly even through uh, the style, my methodology with teaching. Yeah, it's never too late to try something new. Agreed. Yeah, and you're talking about your teaching. How exactly did you get into teaching and training and what drew you to that part of the field? You know, that's that's really interesting because the first job I had in IT, basically, I was waiting tables at the time. There was a company, uh, I was in Greensboro, North Carolina, and there was a company that was running ads on the radio. We need IT technicians. We need this. And I knew nothing about computers. I had just started taking an intro to PCs class um, at a community college. And a friend of mine just really encouraged me, hey, give them a call, give them a call. And so I finally called him up and I said, look, I know nothing about computers, but I'm a hard worker. I'm willing to learn and I will work for cheap. And so at that point in time, those were kind of the magic words. And I wound up uh, getting hired as um, a technician, which basically meant that I brought the guy's coffee at the time, the, the real technicians and engineers. Um, so I was kind of, you know, in the background watching and learning. And as it happened, we had a specialized client that we were working with that needed some training in Microsoft Office products. And because I was kind of the person who wasn't doing anything anyway, that fell into my lap. So it really was kind of um, just sort of accidental, but the very first class I ever taught was on Excel 95. So that tells you how long it's been. And I walked out of that class and I thought, this is exactly what I want to do for the rest of my life. And I've never once looked back. It was just, I had not had a satisfying experience. You know, like I said, at that point in time, I was working tables. I was doing administrative stuff here and there. But man, that first class I taught, I said, this is what I want to do. So that was kind of um, uh, something that opened the door for me. And then I, I stayed around with some of the more simple products like office products. And then I started to see a trend in the industry that certifications were becoming more and more popular, more and more necessary. And so, uh, you know, I just looked to the surrounding environment and said, okay, if I'm going to continue to be in this field, if I want to be successful, certifications are the way to go. And I was really torn at that time between going back to college and getting, finishing, getting a degree, 
or getting certified. And quite honestly, I chose certification rather than a college degree. And I'm so glad that I did. Um, Not to diminish a college education in any way, but in this field, in the IT field, the certification actually opens more doors than college, uh, than a college degree does. Certifications are specialized, they're current. Whereas, you know, if I get a college degree, something I learned in year one here, four years later, that's not even valid anymore. Right. Or at least it's not, it's certainly not the the current technology. So with certifications, they stay, um, uh, you know, they stay up to date, they're valid, they're current and they're specialized so that I can say I don't just have a degree in computer science, but I have a certification in cybersecurity or a certification in information security risk management or whatever that may be. Yeah, it's wonderful to hear more about where you started, how you worked your way up, and also you provide good advice about you know, why these certifications are so important and uh, where they're applicable. I want to learn more about how, what advice do you have for students and individuals who are preparing to take a certification course like CISSP. What just general tips, advice you have for them? Sure. Um, You know, as far as it, and this is just from my experience. I remember when I was making this jump, I didn't know which class to take. I didn't know if I wanted to take a programming class or a networking class or a security class. So, you know, One of the things that I think is nice about uh, Cybrary is that you have the ability to sample from a wide range of courses and a wide range of topics. So at that point in time, I really didn't have that resource available to me. So it was essentially, and it wasn't quite this flippant, but it almost came down to a coin toss, you know, not literally, but I was really just like networking, programming. I didn't know enough to make a good decision. So I went out and did my research, first of all, because we want to make, you know, especially as a career changer, I wanted to make that transition as smooth as possible. So I would recommend, you know, before you just jump in and choose a class, Make sure the class is something you're interested in. This is a huge field. Every personality type can find their own niche in this field. But thank God I didn't try to take a programming class, first of all, because I do not have the brain to write lines of code. I'm just too distractible. I see, you know, oh, look, a squirrel was written for me. To sit down and write code I would have gotten discouraged and I would have never pursued this any further. Fortunately, I went into the direction of more hands-on, more interactive field with networking. So the first thing is find something that interests you. It may not be the first thing that you look at, but you will do so much better if it suits your personality type, if it answers questions that you have, you know, if it's, oh, I've always wondered how this worked. So Find the niche that's yours. Um, Be prepared to fail. And by that, I mean you sit in the class and there will be things you don't understand. That's okay. Go out and look them up or sometimes it's okay just not to know something while you're getting into the field. And when you take that first certification test, not everybody passes the first time. That does not mean you're not going to thrive and flourish in this field. I'll tell you the truth. The very first certification test I ever took was um, back with the Microsoft Systems uh, uh, Systems Engineer certification. And I needed a 700 to pass. And I had this big 1,100-page book, and I took 80 pages of handwritten notes. I have never studied so hard in my entire life as I had for that class. Needed 700 to pass. I get a 683. I was not really used to trying really hard and not being successful. I was kind of the person in high school that could kick back and just uh, absorb information, do pretty well on tests. But I worked hard and I failed this. So I go out into the parking lot back in the days of pay phones. I swear to God, I called my mama. I'm not smart enough to do this. And thank God my mother essentially said in a kindlier way, she said, shut up, 
go stubby. Take this test again next week. I don't want to hear that you're not smart enough to do this. And so I took that advice and I went home and I studied. And I scheduled the exam the next week and I got a 715, which was passing. I didn't say I aced the test. But, you know, as you learn more about the field, you'll do better. You'll understand more. Information will go from being something you memorize to something you understand right? So be patient with yourself, especially if you're a career changer. It's a huge field. There's a lot to learn. Um, Do everything you can to help yourself be successful, right? Don't put this crazy pressure on yourself that you have to, you know, get 100% on every test that you take. Find something that you like. Be prepared to work hard, but know it's going to be worth it in the end. I love what you're saying here. You know, failure is okay. And the failure is not the end of your story. You learn from it and you can still achieve your dreams. And I'm just so glad that you shared that with our audience. And I'm interested in learning more with your new CISSP course. Been listening to it. So much fun. Everyone's going to love it. But what's new for this course? That is a terrific question. So every now and then, ISC Square likes to mix things up a little bit, and they come out and they update the exam. Now, most of the times, and in this case as well, 98% of uh, the material is still the same. It's organized a little differently. It's presented a little differently, but it's the same material. In order to support that, um, any of you that have studied CISSP before may be familiar with the big, thick gold book. It's the all-in-one study guide for CISSP, sort of the de facto standard in the industry used for training. Um, and you'll know it if you if you see it because it literally is like that thick. It's heavy. It's overwhelming. But at any rate, the most recent version of that book that was just released, the main author is Sean Harris. Sean Harris passed away five or six years ago. And yet for the most current issue of the best-selling CISSP book, she's still the lead author. What does that tell you? The whole premise of the CISSP exam is that security transcends technology. Security is bigger than just the technology we use. There are lots of tests out there that focus on the tech. You know, you take Security Plus, you're memorizing port numbers and bit lengths and key um, and block sizes and all this technical stuff. The CISSP exam is always going to, first and foremost, focus on good, solid security principles as the foundation of everything that we do. Those principles don't change. Risk management doesn't change. Um, Separation of resources from trusted to untrusted, that doesn't change, right? So in some ways, it's the same old exam it's always been. You know, I tell people, if I had studied from my flashcards when I first took this exam back in 2000, I would have just a tiny bit of new facts to learn to pass this test. But one of the biggest things I try to stress to my students, this is a course that you want to understand and not memorize. So yeah, are there new technologies out today? Sure, we've got WPA3 instead of WPA2. I don't need you to know about the Dragonfly algorithm. That's way too detailed. I want you to understand how WPA3 fixes problems that were there in WPA2. And I don't mean from an in-depth, under-the-hood perspective. I just mean from kind of this principled security of, well, if we don't have a secure handshake, then anything that comes after the handshake is not going to matter. So I guess what I'm trying to say is we will reference some of these new technologies, and we absolutely will, but the heart and principle of security will not change and continues to be the core of this course and of this exam. So long story short, the answer to that question is there are a few new technical aspects that we're going to cover in here. 
But for the main part, this exam is consistent as it has always been with having a focus on the organization as a whole, risk management, good foundational security principles, and technology is just there to fill in the gaps almost, if that makes sense. Did that make sense? It did. Okay, good. And I love when you're teaching the course, as you said, you know, you're not going on and on forever about you know, a certain key aspect. You, you know, summarize it and you demonstrate the significance and the application often have a story that's very relatable to the learner. So you're absolutely going to enjoy this course. And something I want to end on, a fun question. I would love to hear you. You've been talking about life working in cybersecurity and the different kinds of work that's involved, well, whether you're coding, networking. And I really want to hear more about you know, work-life balance in this type of field. I'd love to know more about how you approach that you know, and also what advice you have for those who are entering or are in the cybersecurity field. Okay. Um, I think work-life balance is one of the most important things uh, that I've learned throughout the years. You know, I have paid my dues in this field. I have put in weeks of 100 hours when I was just moving in uh, to the industry. I have worked weekends. I've worked third shift. I've done a lot. But as I've gotten more established in my field, you know, somebody actually said to me, and I thought about it, it kind of makes sense, is how hard you work is inversely related to how much money you make. So, for instance, you know, when I was in college, I worked um, in a restaurant and I was waiting tables and mopping floors and I was working my buns off, but I wasn't really making a lot of money. Now, I've been in the cybersecurity field for 20 years and I don't have to work as hard because solutions come to me easier. I'm more of a... Um, uh, in more of an elevated position than I am somebody that does the day-to-day -day elements of, uh, you know, I don't configure, I'm not out pulling cables and doing those sorts of things any longer. So what I found is, you know, there was a period of about 10 years where I'd been in IT and felt like I'd almost crossed into a threshold to where, you know, all my life I'd felt like I either had money or I had time, but I never had both of them together. So now I'm at this point of sort of stability in my career where I can have both of those. The cybersecurity field pays really well, but it doesn't pay really well your first job in the first week, right? You know, everybody's selling the solution of, oh, come make all this money. Well, you can, absolutely. It just takes a lot of work and it takes paying your dues. Now, you know, to tell you my, uh, where I am in my life now, we just bought an RV and I throw the family in the RV and we travel around the country. Most of the work I do, I can do remotely. As long as I have a decent internet connection, I will uh, tell you not to try to teach a class from, uh, uh, uh where was it? The New River Gorge, uh, the internet reception there is not so good, which is probably part of the reason it's such a lovely place to be. But at any rate, you know, we travel around when I have to be somewhere in person. I'm there in person, but most of my job, as will be the, the same for many of you, most of the work in IT can be performed remotely these days. So that's a huge benefit. I mean, working remotely saves me two hours a day just in commuting. Um, so what I've found is that the work is satisfying. I love the work. I love my job. I love what I do. But my family life is that much better for enjoying my work, but then also being able to take time off and to do the things that interest me outside of the cybersecurity world. Wonderful to hear that and so important. I hope that it's really valuable advice for those of you listening and it has been such a pleasure to talk with you, Kelly Handerhan. And 
I want to thank all of you at home listening and watching on YouTube, Sounder, Spotify, Apple, all those great places. Tuning into the Cyberry podcast. We'll catch you next week. And thanks so much. Thanks for having me, Sarah. Take care, all.